Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to you, Chief, and your team. And for those who are joining the meeting in person, and all, for all who are on, watching online, we have your report, which covers a broad range of issues and up, updates. So thank you for that. Despite the challenges of the last few months, the single biggest issue still facing policing is the ongoing resourcing crisis faced and new additional pressures now generated from the data breach and the likely outworkings from the judgment delivered in the holiday pay case. Policing and the service it provides remain central to the safety of our community and for our peace process. This weekend marks 22 years since the establishment of the PSNI and the policing board. We recognise the work of officers and staff across the community in responding to calls for, in service, for service. In your report, there are updates on the significant drug seizures in the course of the last few weeks, dealing with hate incidents, murders, vicious attacks, and dealing with the thousands of emergency and non-emergency calls every day of the week. The work goes on, and we are also, we are also starting to see the impacts of resourcing pressures in terms of organisational resilience and gaps in teams, particularly in neighbourhoods and in other areas of police service delivery. So I'm going to hand over to, to your team, uh, Chief Constable, uh, from this point. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for those opening remarks, because they echo, uh, I think, my first few days uh, in post. I'd just like to speak briefly uh, before we go to questions as an opening, firstly, to recent events and also to give people a sense of um, what it's felt like for me coming actually into the organisation, which I know very well because of the time I've already spent here. Um, but to reassure you and reassure the public and uh, and everybody uh, with regards to the excellence that I've seen from the rank and file officers. Uh, and I've been out a lot speaking to people at all levels. Um, I think the communities in Northern Ireland should be very proud of the commitment and the professionalism of the PSNI. Um, we have begun to stabilise even in recent days because of uh, recent events that have caused, I think, a lot of uncertainty and challenge for the organisation um, and given reassurance and support to those hardworking staff. But I've had nothing but positive experiences in speaking to people. There's a lot of rhetoric about low morale, and I'm sure there are concerns about morale, and some of that is justified. But the experiences I've had with the officers and the staff has been very positive. They've been very pleased to see me, and what they've told me about what they're doing is exemplary. There are obviously numerous uh, exceptional police operations going on at the moment, some of which the public see, uh, a number of which that I've looked at closely in the last few days uh, go unseen. But they all demonstrate the strength and versatility of this organisation in keeping communities safe in what is a unique, a unique policing environment and a dangerous environment all too often still. There are several key issues that need to be addressed regarding the organisation moving forward, and I do recognise that. Not least of which is the need to secure a strong financial position, which you've referred to, Chair, uh, for the remainder of this financial year, but also going into next year, into the next financial year, to give a platform that guarantees officer numbers and staff numbers so that we continue to deliver the service the people of Northern Ireland deserve and need. I don't have to pitch the importance of numbers and funding to this board. Um, people say less police means less policing. That can certainly be the case. There are things we can do to help ourselves, but I want to thank the board for their support around the funding issue so far. We need to drive that, though, home to everybody, especially those who are going to make the decisions about our funding going forward. As I've said, there are things, though, that we can do that I've already seen to make ourselves more efficient and make sure that our resources are aligned to our priorities. I'm already looking at what we can do around that. We need to show that we have the leverage with our resources in the right place and that that, that resource that we do have is working to the aims of the organisation. I want to emphasise we'll not always get things right. I'm going to talk about that a little bit this morning. One particular example from uh, recent days. But when we do get something wrong, we'll correct it and we will put it right. 
being a police officer today is harder than I think it's ever been for all sorts of different reasons. And we do need to reset the blame culture button that seems to exist in policing generally. That doesn't, by the way, as some people some, sometimes suggest, conflict in any way with the high standards I expect from all my officers and staff. But we need a learning culture, not a blame culture. The last few days have been particularly humbling to see what people are doing and the hard work that every day uh, is being done to support and look after the communities in Northern Ireland. And it is a privilege to be in this role. I want to speak briefly about things that have happened in the first few days and weeks uh, that I've been here. So firstly, Chris, since my right, has been appointed as the sort of interim temporary deputy chief constable. That was necessary for all sorts of logistical, legal and technical reasons around what we are encountering in the organisation. And Chris has already got quite an interesting intro. I also want to talk about the HMIC report. Now, overall, and I've seen a lot of HMIC reports, it was it was a really quite a reasonable report and a fair report. But it does signpost things that give us an understanding of the sorts of pressures this organisation is going to be under if we don't firstly help ourselves around our resources and leverage them in the right way, but also if we don't get the funding that the organisation needs rather than the cuts that we're currently facing. And in the report, and I will quote because it's important that we start to lobby strongly for this. The report states, we acknowledge that the decrease in officer numbers is likely to have consequences, including one, a significant reduction in neighbourhood policing patrol hours, meaning less visibility, problem solving activity, engagement and reassurance of communities. Secondly, a reduced number of detectives and less experienced detectives. This will limit capacity for the development of intelligence and proactive investigation of terrorism, organised crime and high harm offences such as rape, sexual assault and domestic abuse. And finally, fewer specialist uniform support officers will be reduced capacity for proactive search operations, specialist resource deployment and less resilience to deal with significant public disorder that often, as we know, can occur in this in this place. I know Lee Freeman very well, the HMI. He was a chief constable with me. I have a huge amount of respect for him. I will not ignore, and nor should any of us ignore his comments, and I agree with everything that he said. There's a considerable amount of work to do to stop these consequences from occurring, some of which, as I've explained, we can mitigate, but we need the help of everybody to address the issues that we can't mitigate unless we get sufficient funding. Briefly, I want to mention uh, my own logic. Now, we've already announced that we attended a property on Saturday the 23rd of September following a report of, domestic, of a domestic incident. This is now a live investigation, and it is, it's the position is that I can't comment any further on it. I brought in West Midlands Police, having spoke to the Chief Constable there, to provide independence around the assessment of what we've already done and any further inquiries that needed to be conducted. I think it's helpful for everybody to know that I anticipate a resolution of that matter to be in weeks rather than months because that's in the interest of everybody involved. We've got to give West Midlands, though, the time to do that job, and I won't be commentating any further on that. I also want to mention the face coverings that occurred recently at the criminal trial in Belfast. When I saw those images, I was uh, extremely frustrated, and I know they presented uncomfortable viewing for everybody. But immediately steps were taken to ensure no further such incidents occurred. A PSNI debrief has taken place and a joint one is now going to take place for the court service to identify any learning. I want to be very clear. We, I, will not tolerate such acts of intimidation from anyone. They have no place in society. I spoke to the officer in charge. Immediately I became aware and I was delighted that matters were remedied uh, straight away. Operation Tarlac, the events in Israel and Gaza. 
we've continued to see steady progress, protests, forgive me, and parading activity related to the Middle East conflict. To date, we have not seen the issues related to extremism that have appeared elsewhere in the UK. I have made personal contact with both the Jewish and Muslim communities with regards to those protests. We have got an extremely experienced commander in charge of that activity and a well-rehearsed plan to deal with that protest that so far with the engagement taking place by our officers and staff has worked outstandingly well. I was also part of a meeting with other senior chief constables last week with regards to the National Counterterrorism Coordination Committee that oversees national security. So we are plugged in to everything that's happening with regards to those events. And I'm very alive to some of the legal challenges that have existed for the Metropolitan Police. And we are making sure that we are very much conscious of where the line sits with regards to criminality. Regarding the Canova report, I've already made my position on this clear, but I've handed over responsibility of the Canova report to the interim Deputy Chief Constable Chris Todd beside me to my right. It's his responsibility now to manage that report through the PSNI Strategic Board. I've also met with three in Livingston this week with regards to his continuing activity now as the officer and overall command of Canova. So my responsibility for that has finished. It finished when I handed that report to the PS9 before I was confirmed in this role. I'll not have any part in the internal process with regards to the final phase that that report has to go through. That phase is described in a protocol that is on the Canova website. That protocol sets out that that report has to firstly go through a representations or maximization process which it underwent uh, quite properly uh, earlier this year. It then went through national security checking. Mm -hmm. That is conducted with a cabinet office and all the constituent parts of the security infrastructure who might have concerns about contents of such report, and it passed through that process. And it then went to the Director of Public Prosecutions for the phase that effectively establishes that there's no criminal justice prejudice in the report so that it can be published. The final element of the report, where I, as the OIOC of Canova, in my previous role, hand over that report to the PS9 has occurred. And I recuse myself now of any involvement in that report. The independence of Canova and what I built in that investigative structure for the families and the stakeholders, I am absolutely alive to and I will not compromise that in any way. So that report will now go through the due process that already exists within the PS9 to deal with reports of that nature. The Judicial Review 168, the Omar Road issue, many of you will obviously be aware, if not all, of my decision. And it's been widely reported with regards to not taking any further action with regards to that matter, as regards any appeal to the suspension or relocation of the officers and the determination made by Judge Schofield, which I read in forensic detail along with other documents, and I agreed with the court's position. I'm now working towards resolving the second element of that issue, which is the conduct of the officers at the time. I'm not going to say anything more about that at the moment because. I intend to resolve that in the coming weeks and I'll report fully to the board at the next meeting. But fair, fair to say, I think, that there was lessons learned for everybody in that particular instance, not least of which the broader organisation. And that's what I think we need to focus on. I'm delighted by the, uh, the completion of the Waterside Custody Suite. And I know the board went there on Thursday the 19th of October and I've had a feedback from various people about how well that went. Uh, looking forward to that custody suite getting open. There seems to be a bit of last minute snagging around health and safety. So the date seems to have moved again, uh, but we'll soon resolve that. And Ryan might be able to speak more to that shortly. I just want to mention the search operation in South Armagh, which I was alive to uh, as things were developing 
lifetime. Officers from the Sierra's Crime Branch have recovered a number of weapons, which I'm sure you're now aware, and ammunition during a search, search operation in Cross McGlen earlier this week. A proactive search took place in the Monog Road area on Monday, where a significant weapons hide was discovered in this rural area. An example again of the great work that's being done, often unseen, to keep people safe. Inside were a number of suspected firearms, including two shotguns, seven handguns, three revolvers and an assault rifle, as well as a significant amount of ammunition. All of those items will now be subjected to forensic examination. These searches send a clear message to those involved, forgive me, in organised criminal activity that we will continue to target them and disrupt their activities so that communities can live a safe and peaceful life without fear. Now, Chair, together with my team, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chief Constable. I'm going to move uh, across members now. Uh, if I can go to Mike first on a question on the budget, please. And before that, on a point of order, do you prefer John? Chief Constable, what's... Mike, I've been called many things in my police service. Uh, John would be fine. Appreciate it, John. Um, so hopefully we're going to move focus away from where it's been recently on what I would call hopefully transient issues, such as the data breach, and maybe refocus on, on a, a sad fundamental and enduring issue, which is the budget. So I'm wondering what uh, added value you think you, think you can bring to the debate uh, for additional funds for the PSNI? So um, there's a couple of parts to my answer to that. Firstly, and I did allude to this, we in, internally, the people sitting on this side of the table, I think we can do more than we have been doing. There's no criticism of anybody um, to leverage our assets, okay, to make sure we understand what our priorities are, where all of our costs are across the organisation. And it can be quite surprising when you see all of those costs across the organisation. And to make sure that we've got our, our spend in the right place, our resources dealing with what we think are our priorities. Now, I have been through this process because of what happened in England and Wales around policing for around 15 years of cuts. And I had to find ways of dealing with serious organised crime, terrorism, big spike in knife crime um, and gang crime with less money and less officers. So I've been through this process. Now, some of that was, as I say, re-engineering the business, but in a way that you take your people with you. The, the experts in our business are within the PSNI. This isn't an external thing. But we also need to and I've started that conversation this morning with my remarks earlier. Lobby, we need to talk to people who will be having competing uh, pitches about why money's got to be spent in other areas. And I'm a huge advocate for all public services. But in this particular place in Northern Ireland, if policing goes to some of the levels that the HMIC and Lee Freeman has suggested we might go to, that will have a net negative effect for all public services. So we need to make sure, and me as a civic leader, that the business case, if you will, for the PSNI is known to everybody. That includes in Westminster, that includes the Secretary of State, that includes the NIO. I think from everything I've read and heard, that doesn't include the Northern Ireland Policing Board because I think you understand the issues. But that's what we need to do. And that's what I can assure you we will be doing. I hope I hope that answers your question. It does, if I may risk a, a short follow-up in, in terms of sweating the business more, if I may use that phrase. Do, do you think there's a lot to be done? So what, what I've not seen, and again, there's no criticism at all, and there's always a risk of this, with the nature of how this has evolved, you get salami slicing, if I can call it that, low-hanging fruit taken away. I experienced that when I went to a force that was in severe financial crisis. And, and they were just squeezing the balloon. They were moving a problem from one place to another. Nobody had looked at the entire business. 
And by the way, the best people, I really need to underline that, to do that are the experts in the business who deal with serious crime, the people I've been speaking to this morning about ongoing operations, the people in neighbourhood policing, you know, what Bobby knows about neighbourhood policing for the PSNI. They're the people that we need to get together to understand our business in forensic detail and as to how we best leverage that. Now, what, what I can state and say statistically, and a number of forces had to do this in England and Wales, and I was part of some of the challenge processes for those forces to make sure it was being done with an operational eye, if I can say that. You are going to probably, I'll use your term, sweat anywhere between 15 and 20% of the asset. So that's quite a significant amount of money. Now, what I can't tell you at the moment is if those sorts of proportions are available in the PSNI. I don't know that. And this is a, and I'll say it again, a unique operating environment. If you're going to change the operating model, if you're going to change certain elements of the more sophisticated side of policing, you've got to be very alive to the consequences. And one thing with my terrorism background, my proactive background of serious and organised crime, I'm very alive to those issues. So I need to get my feet under the table and understand the detail of that. OK. OK, thank you. Thank you. And um, before I go to Mark, um, a supplemental from Les. <clears throat> um, welcome and good luck. Um, it probably reflects um, that the first two questions you get are about the budget. Uh, mine is really about the <clears throat> fundamental legal tension between your responsibilities as an accounting officer to live within the budget and they're formidable and your responsibility under the policing act to keep people safe and effectively investigate crime how do you manage those conflicting demands in practice and where do you see your priorities lying um, if we don't resolve the budgetary issues in terms of discussions at a local or a or a uk wide level so interesting question the first thing that happened when I arrived is I got a, I think about an eight page document as the accounting officer. And the way I read it, and this is, I'm sure not the way it was intended. If I went one pound overdrawn, I was going to get put in the Tower of London. Now, listen, I've been here. I've dealt with all of these challenges and these issues. There's always a way through. There's always a middle ground. Um, a lot of this comes around making the, the business case for it. I am fully aware of my accounting officer responsibilities, but if, if we just take a modicum of sort of perspective around this, other public services are in the same position. The accounting officer responsibility, others will, and I want to call it potentially, if we're on the trajectory we're on, they're going to commit technical breaches of that because they're not all going to be able to stay in budget the way existing workforces are established and budgets that are committed to with contracts that if you breach those contracts you get additional financial penalties so there has to be a degree of common sense brought to this my primary responsibility my dna is protecting people from harm preventing crime detecting crime the accounting officer element i'm very conscious of the responsibility around the public purse but I need to protect people in Northern Ireland and everybody at this table shares that same value, that same commitment. It will be me to reach a position where I adequately balance the two at the end of this financial year, if we have the same environment as we have now, but I'm very happy to do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark has a question on cultural and equality audit. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, hello, John. It's good to have you and the team along uh, today, and it's good for us as a board to be back in public session. It's been a while since that's happened as well. I was just wondering, have you had the opportunity to review the progress of the PSNA Cultural and Equality Audit, and would you be in a position to provide any update on it? So I have. I've read the audit. Uh, in detail, it came to the Strategic Management Board, my first Strategic Management Board uh, last week. Uh, the audit will be shared with you. Uh, it's going through the final, if you like, process of, of, of what's required to be done uh, for that process to happen. Um, I would say the cultural audit, as far as I, you know, my, my, my initial opinion when I read it, it was reasonably positive around what a lot of the officers say. 
So, for instance, can do approach commitments, public service. Um, at times of crisis, the entire organisation comes together. I think there are elements of the cultural audit that suggest there needs to be a little bit of work done at the leadership level. Uh, I don't think any of that would surprise people in recent times. Um, I'm probably not in a position to give you a, a more detailed overview at the moment, having gone through it last week. But just to reassure you, that will be shared with you. Uh, it will be it will be shared publicly. And that that will basically provide what the organisation is saying to us, the workforce, and we will provide an answer as to what we're doing with it and what we're doing about what they've said, if that helps. Yeah, uh, that's dead on, John. I was just wondering, from your period in Bedfordshire, was there any learning you thought you might be able to bring uh, to this process or any areas that you feel might actually strengthen the review, potentially maybe with the involvement of more external or, or independent voices bringing them onto the review? So so there is, having looked at how the review was done. I, I don't really want to get into that at the moment because that's, I think, something that we'll speak about in the future. But what I will say, previously when I've gone to organisations, I've met, um, and people know this, it's, been, it's in the public record, high levels of racism, misogyny, boys club stuff. Uh, and I'm, I'd be very happy for this to be tested that those organisations don't have those cultures anymore. This, this audit and speaking to our workforce and giving our workforce confidence around our promotion processes, our selection processes, our talent management processes, the equality that each organisation today should have in uh, fairness with regards to access to specialist roles, all of that is built on the sort of work that that audit has started and provided. So I think we're in a good direction of travel, but obviously we've now got to put in the uh, the plan really to deliver on what the workforce are telling us about their concerns. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to Joanne uh, on a question on duty adjustments and uh, broader occupational health and wellbeing. Thank you, Chair. Um, Interim Chief Constable, page 19 of your report refer refers. Um, just with regard to the duty adjustments project, there are some shocking figures in the paragraph beside with regard to injuries on duty. Um, in terms of the duty adjustments project, I appreciate that you're not going to report until the, the next financial year, but can you give us some indication of initial findings um, of the project thus far and the potential for this project uh, on absenteeism? So I'll start by making some comments on injuries on duties and assaults on police uh, from my perspective. There was Interestingly, there was an article on the BBC about this this morning with regards to uh, a force in England. Our officers more and more face uh, assaults. The statistics across the country are worrying, and I know they are uh, in Northern Ireland. We need to make sure there is. I spoke to Pamela about that this week. There's a 12-point plan where officers are assaulted to make sure that those officers feel valued, they're contacted by a senior officer. Uh, what we need to do is make sure the people who are responsible for those assaults are prosecuted. They feel the full, full force of the law for what they do to our officers. And we need to make sure our officers are looked after. Now, only because, uh, and we had an interim conversation about that, myself and Pamela, the detail of what you're probably asking, I'm not yet over. But I, I don't know if Pamela can help you further on that. Sorry, I think for the purpose, Joanne, in the report, we wanted to sort of raise your awareness to the focus on this, particularly with the duty adjustments and injury and duty. Um, we'll absolutely be feeding back. I think it's scheduled probably come through the resource committee just on the findings of that and, and where the progress is on. I think we're happy to do that um, in more detail and give you some detail on that when we've got it. That's okay. That, that's fine. I'll give you some time to do that. I just was wondering if, if what had come out of the week of focus, but that's fine. We can wait for that. Um, just to move on to another issue um, around occupational health and well-being. Um, I'm disappointed that Claire's not here to ask her the question, but I would appreciate if somebody within the team can give me an answer. Um, at this stage, we're advised that there's a six six to eight month waiting list for um to be seen by occupational health. Um, I think that's unacceptable. Um, I'm wondering what what assessment has been made of the impact of the delay on officers being seen in terms of their own well-being um, and 
the resultant outcomes in terms of absenteeism, both short term and long term. That's my first part. And the second question is, what is being done then to address these delays and the extra damage that is potentially being caused to those officers? So I will probably defer to Pamela in a second on that. But ju just so you know, th this is core issue for me. We've got a number of officers, about 1,100, I think, on recuperative duty. So they've got a warrant card, but they're not in a role where they need that warrant card. I think we've got over 600 officers currently sick. OK, now that's the size of a police force. So when I talk about leverage, leveraging or sweating, to use Mike's comment, our, our assets, that's what we need to do. But we need to bring those people back into operational roles when they're well enough to undertake those roles. Um, some interesting data that I think in 2020, 2021 that I looked at the other evening, I read a lot of very uh, sad things late at night. We've gone from 11, 11 days per officer average sickness to 22. It's doubled. Uh, police staff, I think, has gone from eight point something to 12 point something. Now, listen, there's all sorts of reasons for, for this that I think, you know, Pamela and I have had a very positive discussion about trying to understand what sits behind this and make sure that we provide timely uh, care and support to officers around, um, you know, getting them back in the workplace. COVID would have had an impact. The current um, uh, NHS waiting times will have an impact. We We'll, I'm sure there's more that we can do. But it's one of the things that has sort of come off the page at me in the first few days that we need to do some more work on this. Uh, but I'll I'll let Pamela carry on. Thanks, Joanne. And I know you've raised this a number of times, and I think it, it probably does merit um, us pulling a more detailed briefing together, and then whether it's a resource committee or, or, or a workshop or indeed yourself to give you some more information on it. Um, the waiting lists have been increasing. Um, John's touched on, I mean, our occupational health services there in many ways to supplement and augment um, getting people access as quickly as possible. Uh, and with waiting lists being quite, quite lengthy in the health service, um, that's really our ambition to do that. And we have in recent times further invested into aspects of the mental health, both internally, um, employing people ourselves, and indeed get, providing access to our workforce to an external provision on that as well, which the waiting times are much shorter on. Um, but the waiting times are still longer than we would like them for some of the access to our service. Um, initial triage is conducted quite quickly um, and, and prioritisation is put around that. But whether it's access to things like physio or indeed some of the mental health service, um, some of those are longer than we would wish. Um, and an aspect of it, again, is an, el an element around the funding that we can put into that as an organisation uh, beyond what we've currently got there. But John has touched on it. It's a, it is genuinely a priority for us uh, and is important to us to sort of support people and get them back to work as quickly as we can uh, in that process. I think, Chair, what I'm trying to focus on here is, and I think that you need to focus on, is the interim damage that can be done to a person in terms of their well-being from the minute they report that they've got problems. Bear in mind what some of these officers are seeing. The damage that's done in that six to eight month period where, they're, where their issues are not being addressed and they're having to wait for treatment and and i think that that's bound to have an impact on absenteeism and that's why i'm interested in this duty adjustments project too because i don't believe that you've assessed the damage that's being done to officers in that interim period and i think you should okay hey, thank you joanne um and nula has a supplemental before i go on to edgar on another issue um thank you yeah. chair um i just want to ask following on from that and i understand that the project is a big piece of work and it won't be finalized until next year however and um, there are some concerns, and um, particularly when um, serving officers, those who are whether they're awaiting um, ill health retirement or those who, who are off sick at the minute um, around written improvement notices. And we'd like just some assurances um, that the <clears throat> length of time which an officer will be served one of those will not be decreased further um, because that does bring with it a lot of um, um, issues, not only just in physical health, but also suffering um, from mental health too. And also whether any officers who are actually pursuing in health, um, ill health and retirement are also served written improvement notices, um, because that is an issue that is coming up again and again with um, board members. And I hope it is included um, in the review. And I understand you won't be able to say everything here today, but it's it, two serious issues that are just coming up um, quite often. So very briefly, I'm aware 
of the um, backlog and ill health uh, ill health retirements that uh, actually I know go through the board. So where there is you know too much cholesterol, we'll we'll apply common sense. The issue around any sanctions for any outstanding discipline, I, I think we've got to be pragmatic around these issues because it's not helping anybody. It's not helping them, and it's not helping the organisation. Uh, and often those officers and staff have worked tirelessly for many, many years and they deserve to be exited with dignity. Uh, you know, I, I just want to go back to the point, Joe, policing isn't complicated. Our staff will do amazing things, but they, and they do the discretionary effort that police officers and police staff put in uh, is exemplary in public service. But we do need to look after them. And, uh, you know, I, I need to get into the detail of some of this. And I think Pamela's done some great stuff. I think the team have done some great stuff. Um, but what I can assure you of, and, and everybody at this table, from everything I've heard so far, we know those staff need to be looked after. We can do more and we will do more. Um, but please give me a little bit of time on some of that. OK. OK, thank you. I'm going to move on to get Edgar on a question on, on drugs. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Chief Constable. Um, first of all, congratulations to you and your team uh, in terms of the seizures recently. Uh, at our last board meeting, uh, I think the figure was £7 million worth of drugs that have been seized. Uh, more recently, the Organised Time Task Force uh, picked up something like 300,000 uh, illicit uh, prescription drugs, which is, is, is huge, and a further £1.7 <clears throat> million pounds, uh, of cannabis in, in Cookstown recently. So very significant fines. Uh, and as I say, congratulations to all concerned. It is, however, chilling uh, that these volumes of drugs are circulating in our community at this time. And I suppose there's two questions. And first of all, uh, how, how do our seizures compare, our, our uh, use of illicit drugs compare with uh, elsewhere in the United you know, Kingdom, the Republic of Ireland. And I suppose secondly is to, to ask you to assess the extent to which the PSMI are actually getting to grips with the problem. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to defer to Chris to my right on some of the some of the aspects and maybe the detail of that question. If Chris has got it, it may not. We may have to come back to you on that, in which case, of course, we will. What I will say, drugs, all of us in this room have known, I think, through all of our lives about the harm that drugs do in all levels of community, by the way, but certainly some of those more deprived communities. Uh, I, I ran a drug squad as a detective sergeant in Brixton where we we were involved in um, addressing the scourge when crack cocaine really took siege in London and, and the violence and the intimidation that that brought with it. And that sort of that sort of behaviour, that sort of criminality, continues with drugs to this day. The number of seizures that we have achieved, the activity that the PSI are doing around drugs, and I'm not going to be able to give you a comparison with other forces at the moment, but I know that's one of the areas that other forces have not been as strong on in England and Wales as I think they should have been, because I think it's a core element of one of the areas of carrot and stick around people who choose a life of crime. And I know a number of forces have been criticised for not focusing on drugs. But what I've seen, the PS9 is focusing on drugs. They will continue to focus on drugs. And those seizures and the activity and some of the figures that you've alluded to are, are, are should be celebrated. It's a positive thing. Somebody suggested to me, you know, the, the, there was a question about are we losing control? I think that shows that we're trying to ensure that we've got control as opposed to losing control. So I think it's a positive story around the statistics that have been released. But I will hand over to Chris for, uh, if he's got anything to add around the detail of your question. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Edgar. Um, yeah, just a couple of points, really. I think, I think um, as the Chief says, it, you know, it, it, tackling drug trafficking activity is a strategic priority for us. Uh, and the uptake, uptick in seizures uh, and arrests associated with that, I think, is is evidence of our focus and intent uh, and nothing more than that. It demonstrates the, the hard work that our people are committed to to tackling this, this particular problem. In terms of comparisons with other places, um, it's very difficult to compare with the Republic of Ireland um, because the, the different counting rules that, that we're um, committed to um, in, in line with the Home Office in England, the Wales, etc. 
Um, and of course, you'll be probably aware of a significant seizure um, in the south um, in September, which uh, uh, two and a quarter tons, I think, a hundred million pounds worth of cocaine seized, which will have a, a particular skewing effect if we were look at you know, compare uh, at the moment. But in terms of in England and Wales, we seize more drugs uh, on than on average uh, than you will see in England and Wales. Um, a factor of of five in. Northern Ireland to three on average across England and Wales. Um, but, you know, um, uh, as the chief says, the, the amount of effort you, you put into tackling these issues um, means that you will see more seizures uh, and you will see more arrests. So I think it is a positive indication of, of our focus and intent. Welcome your, your answers. Uh, and, and obviously the importance of dealing with it at a high level. Uh, I have to say, in addition to that, um, through some other contacts that I, I have through, through the schools network, uh, that is, is becoming a significant issue within a number of schools. And um, I think also emphasise just the importance of our neighbourhood officers working within those local communities. Thank you, Edgar. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm going to go to Peter on a question on HMIC, please. Uh, thanks, Chair. And uh, like others, John, uh, welcome and congratulations and congratulations to Chris as well. C can I um, come back in a, in a way to the budgeting question and one of the uh, suggestions within the Peter report, the HMIC report, um, and it's not so much about the amount of funding, it's about the, the way the funding is provided. It makes a comparison with some of the services in GB and says that there are uh, longer term settlements that GB uh, services get compared to shorter term settlement that on funding that the PSNI get. Do you agree with that analysis? And could you say something about the impact of that in terms of the ability of the PSNI to more strategically plan in the longer term? Yeah, no, I'm pleased, to, very pleased to help with that. So in, in England and Wales, there are a number of levers that you can uh, at times of need pull. One, of course, is um, so you can carry over re reserves. Some forces in England and Wales have carried over tens of millions of pounds of reserves. The funding formula for England and Wales is uh, is outdated. It's quite analogue. It's not digital. But uh, some forces who don't have the strategic threats of others seem to get more funding. So that automatically, at times of any if you like, strategic cuts to policing, gives them uh, a pool of money that allows them still to operate at the same levels that they always had because they've got these reserves to fall back on. That reserve that reserve amount varies force to force, but it was something that I was able to um, rely on in Bedfordshire, although our reserves, and that there are there are accounting rules about how much you can you should have in reserves. Um, so that's that's the first thing. You can't carry reserves here. The second thing is around presets. In, in England and Wales, there's an opportunity through local council tax collection that you can uh, uh, recover more money um, for the force through that if you um, do a sufficiently strong business case to the Police and Crime Commissioner who supports you on that. And in addition to that, there are the various, there are various funds through the Home Office that might be associated to gang crime violence against women and girls, gun crime, um, neighbourhood policing around problem-solving and social behaviour. Now, because of the nature of where I policed, we've been able to get money from all of those funds. Here, there isn't any such access to additional funding. You get what you get. There is also, of course, the money that's allocated to Northern Ireland, which... Uh, may be allocated under the formula and intended to the police doesn't necessarily come to the police either. So the, the ability to leverage additional uh, monies here is considerably less, if not minimal, compared with uh, GB. Now, that is something that I think... Uh, we might need to have some conversations about around access to uh, how we might get additional funding like that. But it also, the, the, the in-year, one-year settlement, what business 
what business anywhere would operate on the basis of that you only get a one-year budget, that you can't plan for what you're going to do moving forward. It's it's not a, it's not a way to run an organisation, uh, you know, of eight hundred odd million pounds, uh, especially with the responsibility. And this is across public services. I absolutely uh, respect and understand that. Um, but you know, we we it's another element. It's not an answer to your, to your question, but we we need to work more smartly with other public services as well. Uh, and I'm sure they'd agree with that. But it is incredibly difficult because we are really restricted in what we can do as things stand at the moment in in getting additional money even if there's the justification for it so we don't have the same opportunity that colleagues have in england and wales and that's something i think that strategically we need to look at in the future thank you peter just a a, a quick observation i i can't think of many other services that would uh, where longer term certainty would be of greater advantage than it would be to the policing because you're dealing with some short-term issues, but you can see longer-term trends. Yeah. And so uh, being able to make those strategic decisions based on where you know the money is coming from seems to me quite important. And it is a, a, something I think we need to have more conversations about. Well, just just quickly on that, I mean, I know there's been questions about paramilitary activity. I asked the question in recent days about what's the forward look around budgets and they're looking at a nine percent decrease and some of the statistics around what they've done is hugely important that shouldn't be a one-year plan that should be a five-year plan to eliminate those paramilitaries but we're stuck with this funding model of of in one year uh, and that's that is no way to do business that handicaps the ability of this force to plan strategically okay okay thank you uh, i'm going to move over to makesh on the incident in Derry, london Derry. Thank you, Chair, and welcome to you, Interim Chief Constable, and your entire team. Um, I want to refer to the incident that took place on the 8th of September, I think it was, where your officer seized a number of explosives and weapons, grenades, etc. Um, and echo Edgar's um, words of commendation to those officers for doing such a good job. Um, during that process, there was a number of officers that were injured. Uh, we wish them a, a speedy recovery and back to work. But my question is about the fact that during that whole um, raid, there were a number of children at the front line throwing stones, um, petrol bombs to at, at the police. I just want to ask what level of engagement is taking place in the community by the police to try and tackle that. So some of these kids were as young as eight or nine years of age. Um, and also in terms of engagement with other statutory agencies who have a greater um, responsibility for childcare. Thanks for your question. I mean, obviously it predates my arrival here in this role, but because of my connection to Northern Ireland and I'm here a lot, I was very aware of what happened and I thought the outstanding response to the PSNI, but I'll probably defer to Bobby on some of the details on that. Is that okay, Bobby? Yeah, thanks, Chief. And Mikesh, thanks for your question. I know members of the board's partnership committee had an opportunity to hear firsthand from some of the commanders that were on the ground on that particular day. And I know that this is one of the issues that they highlighted. And I think it illustrated the, the particular challenge for them in terms of dealing with both the, let's say, the criminal justice matter that they had to deal with. Then on top of that, the serious disorder, which presented a threat to their own officers. But then in addition to that, the makeup, the makeup of the crowd and the dynamic itself also made it quite challenging in terms of ensuring that we had a, a proportionate and human rights compliant response to that. So an exceptionally difficult set of circumstances. They described, I believe, a number of the most active people involved in that rioting activity as being under the age of 10, which is uh, you know of great concern. We do have really good relationships up there, both in terms of the, the kind of work that we do on a daily basis through our neighbourhood policing teams, but also with partners. I know on the, the evening in question, we had a bit of a perfect storm of perfect, you know, uh, September weather like we'd never seen before. Uh, the schools had finished as well, just around the time of the operation, which meant that there were a large number of young people who were on the ground that day. And I know Mark had mentioned to us as well instances over the next number of nights where parents were potentially even taking their children out the locations 
in order to potentially engage. So I think all that just illustrates the, the challenge that the officers face and it reinforces the need for really effective engagement, both with the young people themselves through the community, local schools, and then other providers who have, as I said in the past, also worked very closely with us in terms of minimizing the risks to young people, both in terms of their own safety, but also the risk of them potentially being drawn into um, and engaged in activity, which could have an impact on their future. So it's something that we continue to work away at. Fortunately, we see less and less of this, which I think is a measure of the progress that has been made. But when we do see these incidents, it is, of course, of great concern to us. OK, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, and I suppose, I'll mark a view supplemental to this one. Yeah, good. Just, just a wee clarification, yes, even yeah. like uh, McKay's for the question and yeah. Bobby for the answer, just in terms of what it is, just, just to clarify, yeah. it was adults, not necessarily parents. Thank you, Bobby. Okay, okay thank you. Um, um, I'm going to go to Linda on speeding up justice. Thank you, Chair. Just in relation to and the accountability report on page 21, you talk about the Speeding Up Justice Initiative pilot. So just want to get some guarantees around what this means in practical terms in relation to ensuring that it is robust as it was before and that those who are making the decisions who may not have been decision makers previously are sufficiently trained in doing so because we want and and. To put it in context, I absolutely want to see justice sped up, um, but I want to ensure that justice is still effective and it is fair and it will be stand up to scrutiny. So I'll I'll hand over to Ryan around some of the details of that. But what what just just to give my own position on some of this with the work I've done on Canova and the examination of files that have been submitted some time ago to the Public Prosecution Service, I have a very good relationship with DOPP Stephen Heron. And we've agreed to meet to talk about the timings of decisions, uh, what we can do around the criminal justice system. He says he's got some really uh, good ideas that, uh, you know, he thinks can help this whole process. So just in a very, it's a very high level, but we had conversations over the weekend to try and um, uh, make sure that we could agree a position to come together to, first recognise, but then see exactly what we could do, brainstorm to try and deal with some of these issues. Because the delays to, 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 to families that I've experienced are, you know, the PPS I'm sure don't want those delays. I certainly don't want those delays. And the families shouldn't have those delays. Um, so it's something that's uh, particularly um, close to me because of what I've seen. But I'll hand over to uh, Ryan to talk about the specific elements of the report. Uh, thanks, Chief, and thanks, Linda, for, for your question. I think there's consensus amongst us all that there's much work to do in speeding up the justice system uh, to make it more proportionate, quicker for victims, uh, and to free up time for all those involved. So it's um, justice has seemed to be done more quickly than it can be at present. Um, the pilot, and I, and I welcome your support of it, I think provides a really good opportunity to do some of that. Um, and in brief, for colleagues who aren't aware of the pilot, um, at present, when police officers feel there's no prosecution on a file, that will go through to the PPS. We will make a decision on that, and in well over 90% of those, they agree with that decision. Um, so the pilot will see that um, coming back to the PSNI and not moving through to the PPS. Um, and to reassure you, uh, there are a number of checks and balances in the system to make sure that decision-making uh, we get that absolutely right. Um, important to say that uh, the um, pilot has been agreed by the Criminal Justice Board, which has, of course, the key strategic partners involved in the justice system in Northern Ireland. And I think that's so important um, that this isn't just something the PSNI are taking forward on their own. It's with the agreement of the broader system. And I think this is critical um, because that allows the appropriate scrutiny of it, um, uh, Linda. Um, we will, in terms of training our own staff, there's a whole process of training ongoing in relation to that, and indeed a whole programme of quality assurance in terms of how those decisions are made. Um, but I do think it could take significant amounts of um, work out of the system in a way that is proportionate. There are guarantees about the appropriateness of the decision making in it. But I think we were all, and in particular victims and witnesses who are the key people in this process, will see benefits from that pilot as part of broader work to speed up justice. Thank you, Chair. And can I just 
I suppose, as an add-on, ensure communication with the victims because, as we know, that's very often the biggest complaint. They don't know what's happening, so making sure that, that people know exactly what's happening, when it's happening and why it's happening. Such an important point. I mean, I'm our kind of victims champion for PSNI, and for me, it's critical that victims are well informed about where they sit in the system, uh, so they don't feel that they're a passenger. They're actually a key part of it. So, hundred uh, percent take on board. Your okay, point. thank you. Um, I'm going to go to John now on a question on neighbourhood policing. Uh, th thanks, Chair. John, could I add my welcome to, to that uh, of those expressed by, by others and, and wish you well. Uh, you, you mentioned today in your opening remarks the some of the difficulties faced by the police senior team and indeed this board in, in recent months. And of course, we all know that that had an impact negatively on confidence in policing. Um, but we also know that officers on the ground were going to work every day, despite those challenges to to help people and keep them safe. So, so my question is, given the importance of neighbourhood policing teams in terms of community engagement and also in terms of building that, that confidence in policing, can I ask you, can you commit to rebuilding the numbers of neighbourhood team officers? And those numbers have been depleted in recent times and therefore you use that opportunity as a way to, to rebuild confidence in policing and continue the engagement in communities? So my background is very much crime, organised crime, uh, counter-terrorism. But I am, and my previous role as a chief constable, I am the biggest advocate, the biggest advocate you will find for community policing and neighbourhood policing. When I went to a force that was in uh, crisis they had lost all of their community intelligence the eyes and ears about young people were getting into um, into organised crime often through no choice of their own we lost any radar or any understanding of what happened vulnerability uh, we lost uh, all uh, opportunities around partnership work we had neighbourhood policing in name only and that's why I reorganize the force to find the resources to have meaningful well-staffed neighborhood policing and what that led to and the data all shows it is that we reduced 999 calls we achieved interventions that otherwise wouldn't have happened we steered people away from crime young people that you know we're all we're all, we were all young once um just needed an off-ramp there, weren't, there wasn't an offer, not from a policing perspective. Somebody came into custody at 15 years of age. We weren't thinking, how do we stop that person coming in again? So neighbourhood policing is uh, is going to be core to the PSNI uh, if I remain in this seat. I know Bobby's done some outstanding work in neighbourhood policing. Um, committing to numbers with the budgetary issues that you're aware of, I'm, I'm not going to be able to commit to anything, but I'm hoping my comments now show that if we do have to reduce numbers and some of the headcount being spoken about is extraordinary and unacceptable, we probably have to reduce numbers everywhere. But we will maintain neighbourhood policing because of the uniqueness of Northern Ireland. That's the heartbeat of the PSNI. So neighbourhood policing would remain very much a priority for this organisation. Uh, and I hope that reassures you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Trevor on uh, Cross McGlen and Maz. Thank you, Chair. Um, John, I suppose, I mean, in terms of congratulations, congratulations to your officers, in terms of your remarks in Cross McGlen, I think that's a very welcome for any right thinking person from the general public. However, it it seems to be slow in terms of determining whether it's organised gangs or whether it's terrorist related. I think the police have been very slow coming forward. Is there any reason for that or can you shed any more light on relation to those who you suspect are involved or who those particular weapons belong to? That's the first question. I'm going to roll these out, but we're just trying to speed things up. Mm -hmm. The second one, and I, I welcome your comments around the masked men in the courts, and I think the action you've taken in relation to that, that's welcome, uh, and your comments around the Jewish community because of what's happened in the Middle East. However, you haven't made any reference 
to the the individual who was dressed in the Halloween parade in London Derry um, with full, I mean, I can only describe as paramilitary uh, regalia yeah. and why something hasn't been done in relation to that, why the police weren't more swift on that occasion to arrest that individual. Sorry. If you put your mic on. Sorry. If I go first to uh, the ongoing operation around the recovery of the weapons, as a long-standing senior investigating officer, I know that, uh, and I spoke to the officer who did the recovery, and overnight the officers who actually stood in the rain in all that terrible weather to make sure that we secured that scene and we properly recovered that material, so forensically, hopefully, assist us in the investigation. Uh, we will, and it won't take too much longer, uh, explain exactly what we understand the position to be with those weapons. I'm aware of it. I've had a proper briefing on it. I've asked some very probing questions on it. But because we are yet to, uh, that is not a live investigation, I'm not going to go any further with that at the moment, but you will get to know uh, our understanding about where those weapons came from and who, who had access to them yeah. and who put them there uh, with regards to organisational responsibility. Okay, that's the first thing. Um, I want to go to your last point, because what was the second point? Sorry, that was the... About the individual the and the paramilitary dress in London Derry. It's the third point. But the mass men, are you happy with my response on that? Okay. The Crossman Glen thing, so I was sent yesterday. I get sent a lot of things uh, since I've been in Northern Ireland. Whenever there's a tweet made by somebody or a, or a newspaper article or whatever, I got sent that image. And obviously, uh, uh, I thought it was foolhardy and stupid whoever did that. So I had a conversation with the team to find out what had happened, had our officers seen this. I know people in Derry, London Derry. So I rang somebody that I knew would have access to the CCTV. So unless the position changed this morning, this was yesterday, none of our police officers saw anybody in that uh, outfit. The Nobody has made a complaint uh, to any of the, either the staff who are, stewarding and security for the event and the event took place over three or four days there is no trace of it whatsoever and there's a suggestion been made to me and this will be interesting if this is the case that it might even have been some sort of artificial intelligence image that was presented and has been circulated now i don't know at the moment i can't give you an answer on that but that was the suggestion last night uh, if it's the image that I saw of somebody dressed basically as a Hamas fighter, if that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So when I became aware of it, and the officers were very alive to the um, the irresponsibility and the potential criminality of somebody dressing like that, you have to think of the context of the event when I think significant numbers were in costumes. That was stupidity at best, if it's genuine. But at the moment, I have to tell you, we can't find any any witnesses or anybody saying that somebody was walking around dressed like that during the events of Halloween. So the jury's out on that at the moment. Okay. Okay, I'm supposed to come back to my first question in relation to Cross Midland, <clears throat> and I appreciate that you're on the interpost, um, but you might be aware of the review that took place in Cross Midland. Well, it seems since the review, um, the activity in the Cross Midland area has increased between police vehicles being damaged driven off the road and other activity within the cross Midland area. Um, if you were to remain in post, would you have any view in terms of reversing the decision in cross Midland to keep that presence there until things certainly calm down for a reasonable period of time, as opposed to rushing ahead with the decision to close the station, given there's been such an uprise in activity in that particular area? So I can't make uh, any commitment around police stations and Whenever you open new custody suites, close police stations, shut counters, and all this I've encountered because of budgetary challenges and pressures in a previous life. What I will say, if there is a threat to officers or communities that's a residual threat, and we need to be in those communities, then we will be in those communities. What I can't commit to is any estate provision that we may be committed to at the moment. But if what you describe you know, is accurate, and I'm sure, of course, it is, then we won't be coming out of any areas, uh, but I can't commit to any estate. I really can't until I get to the detail of that. I don't know if Pamela has anything to add on that. Yeah. 
probably straddled. It's not actually an estate driven. It was the South Arma review, I think, that you're referring to, which was very much an operational review. I don't know, maybe Bobby from a, an operational perspective on it. Um, estate wasn't, apart from this, estate was in a terrible condition, you know, um, so for officers to work in it or so forth, but it was very much an operational and, and really the service is covered from both Arma and Yuri, but I don't know if operationally you want to. Yeah, I mean, just to say, Trevor, obviously we keep operational safety and security of officers under constant review. I'm aware of the type of incident that you're referring to a number of times when police vehicles have been rammed. Sadly, that wouldn't have been uncommon over the years anyway. But again, with the local district commander, we'll continue to look to make sure we have the right operational policing footprint, whether that's stations or other measures in order to protect the safety and well-being of our officers and staff. OK, thank you. I'm going to go to Brendan now on a question on paramilitary crime task force. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, John, one of the uh, stark statistics, I thought, in your re report to the board uh, is that over the past year, there were 19 casualties of paramilitary-style shootings, which is three times the number of the previous year. Now, that's against the backdrop of intimidation and violence by masked men in North Down. And most recently, as you referred in your opening remarks, the uninhibited appearance of masked men within our courts. So would you accept that there is little evidence that the paramilitary crime task force is having any significant impact on paramilitary gangs in Northern Ireland? And what assurance can you give the public that there will be more impact, impactful uh, action going forward? So I... I've been quite alive to paramilitary activity here because of a number of families that I deal with uh, with regards to the legacy work I've done. And I'm, I'm very alive to the work of the Paramilitary Crime Task Force. I met with the IRC in, I think, my second day. So I met um, Tim O'Connor, Monica McWilliams and John McBurney. They've obviously got a report that's due out in, I think it's going to be December. And I also have looked at some of the statistics that I don't have in front of me, but I think Chris might be able to help with. That task force has done some outstanding work. There are some really impressive and compelling figures, statistics around seizures, warrants. And what I said to the IRC, and obviously I know Monica and John very, very well, it was the first time I met Tim, is that we are, we are the stick. The work that needs to be done around these paramilitary activities isn't, it's not our show. We're there if people decide to take criminal activity to deal with it. It's a multi-agency approach. If, if those young men, mainly young men, choose to go into a life of crime and intimidation and exploitation, we will deal with them. And that's part of what the Paramilitary Crime Task Force is there for. Other interventions, and I'll use the term off-ramps for them, need to be in place. They need to have options and choices. But if they don't choose to step away from crime, we will deal with them robustly. Um, and I have to say, the feedback I got from the IRC was that's precisely what we're doing. They're very impressed with the work of the PS9. It's another example of my early days about the often work that's unseen that the organisation are doing to keep people safe and tackle this sort of awful, um, you know, intimidation and gangland style activity. But I'll defer to Chris because I think Chris has probably got uh, some more detail around the activity of the Crime Task Force that might help you. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Brendan. Yeah, I could just add a, a few details to that for May. So first of all, the, the first point around the, the number of paramilitary style shootings. So you're absolutely right um, uh, in terms of the statistics that you quoted there. But it's also important to put that in the context of, of the trajectory over the last five years, because we do see, see peaks and troughs in all of this. Um, so there have been some peaks in that period. But when you look at it over a five-year period, it still is a continuing downward trend, which is reassuring. Um, and when you look into the detail within that as well, um, I think we should be reassured that notwithstanding that each and every one of these instances is unacceptable um, and is tragic for the, those that are involved and, and, and those around them, 
Um, but there have been no young people under 18 um, victims of this in the last couple of years, which is a stark um, change as well, which we should we should uh, commend everybody involved in this work for. Uh, of course, this is all part of the Tackling Paramilitaries programme and PCTF is one element of that. Um, the IRC, as we said, the Independent Reporting Commission, um, in the past has always reported very favourably on the work of the PCTF. We await their report this year. I don't want to predict that, but we're hopeful that, that that will be reflected. And we have invoked independent reviews as well through through the MPCC, uh, Serious Organised Crime Directorate, um, El Portfolio. Uh, and to quote the uh, the last report that came from them, um, it, it, one of the, the highlights was the PCTF is performing well against the objectives and they are increasing outputs year on year. Um, this year to date, they are responsible for 38 arrests and 83 searches. Uh, 65 disruptions, um, which we categorise according to the, the standards that we commit to, 13 of which were moderate and 52 minor. But this is all going towards the disruption. Uh, 31 firearms, 21 weapons, 16 other ammunition seizures, um, 198 um, um, searches. This is over the 22-23 the year uh, in total and 75 individuals then. Uh, I appreciate I'm bombarding you with statistics that won't, won't necessarily go in uh, as I speak, but um, for reassurance, perhaps we can bring some, some of that detail to the performance committee next week and we can go through some of that with you. But in summary, uh, I would echo the comments of the chief that we are satisfied that the PCTF are doing outstanding work and are making a difference. Uh, Chris, uh... Thank you. That's 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 very helpful uh, and and to some degree re reassuring. Um, in relation to the information to the performance committee, uh, I mean one of the issue is uh, the leaders of these organisations you know, and trying to cut off the head, as it were, so that we be, we start to dismantle as opposed to disrupt. Um, and in that, the importance of using all the tools that we have in our box, and in that regard, the 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 opportunity to deny these people their assets and the legislation that's now in place to allow us to do that uh you know uh, i'm thinking of account freezing orders disclosure orders unexplained wealth orders um so it would be good to have an understanding as to the police's uh, capacity to utilize these tools to tackle the heads of these organizations and whether there's a resourcing issue that is inhibiting that Okay, I'm, so, I'm just in the interest of time, folks. I'm just conscious of, of other people with questions, whatever, Brent. And if it's okay, we can maybe deal with that in the performance committee if, if you're satisfied with that and, and with, with yourself, Chief, as well. Um, and I'm going to go to Morris. Morris, you have a couple of questions, but if, if you could pick your, your top one out of that on the Coleraine Custody Suite and Associated Issues. Thank you very much, Chair. I'll, I'll try and be brief. I uh, welcome the interim Chief Constable and his team to today's meeting. Uh, but so at a time of budget constraints and low numbers and officers, uh, I'm asking for a future update uh, regarding the travel times uh, from taking officers from their duty to take prisoners from the Causeway Coast and Glens area, which is quite a geographical spread, uh, to the custody suite uh, in Waterside. Uh, the, the, the cost of those officers being away from police duties and what would happen if an officer team are in, on, on route with a prisoner or prisoners and another incident happens across the Causey Coast and Glens area, and a second car then is taken. Uh, there is a cost implication uh, of, of removing officers from police duty or prisoner duty. Uh, and I'm wondering, could that be monitored and a report brought back to the board to reflect of the savings expected by closing Korean custody suite are actually genuinely thought out? Because nobody has brought me any information on what the timings or the expense of the timings would be for travel. So thank you. I mean, these are these are important questions because you know staff they are incredible and they're amazing. But if if you ask them to go and work in a different building and and some of these housekeeping issues, they rightfully get concerned about them. And we, I've seen in London because of the catastrophic reduction in estate and custody suites. Police officers travelling for two hours plus in traffic with prisoners, and then they're effectively queuing to get into a custody suite. And obviously, if you think of the implications of that to the time that they should be actually protecting the public. I mean, Ryan, I know we'll be able to answer your question, but what I would reassure you 
is because we this is to reassure staff who are involved in this who are affected by it. A proper evaluation will be done around travel time, implications operationally of any changes to how things were previously. But this is one of the potential uh, implications, not necessarily caused by current budgetary concerns with regards to this estate. I, I don't know that. But these are the sorts of areas that will cause us significant issues with a future policing model if we go to some of the reductions that we had talk, talked about. So we have to make reductions of estate and we have to have a slightly different way of operating. Uh, but I want to reassure you, if this is staff concerns, we will make sure that we assess any changes, the implications to them, and we'll do that with staff to make sure that um, effectively we go on that journey together. But I'll defer to Ryan on any if specific... I, if, I, if I can jump in again, it, would, would you mind if we put that to written response, if, I, if, if you're happy enough with that on that, on that course, area? Yeah. I'm just conscious of time. Great response, uh, of course. Yeah. Well, yeah, if that's okay, if that's okay. Okay, Morris. Yeah, yeah, Chair. And just since Corey and Cosby Suite closes today, it'll be good to start uh, that monitoring from today. And it's not a staff issue; okay. it's a budget issue. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, but we'll we'll respond if we can ask a response in writing after that. So, uh, I have two more questions. Um, and I'm going to go to Nula on illegal posters. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, and also welcome interim chief in your in your current role. Um, and I'm sure that you and your team were aware of the ongoing hate incidents crime that's been taking place um, and been manifesting in the use of posters that are directed at housing issues. Um, it's mostly been concentrated in the Beaver area in the past few days, but actually these are popping up more and more right across Northern Ireland. And it's it's obviously not just uncomfortable viewing, but it's it's a hate incident, a hate crime. Hopefully people can actually be pursued. But what is your assessment of the actual threat behind these? And what in terms of the police presence in these local communities and neighbourhood can we see over the coming days, not only to make the community feel safe, but also to actually target individuals who are obviously going um, under the cover of darkness to, to erect these posters to intimidate people out of communities and areas? So firstly, anything to go to your question from a sort of strategic perspective, anything that's done to intimidate any community um, is unacceptable and we will uh, do everything necessary uh, to address that and we'll apply all the legislation available to do that. Uh, it's a bit like the broken windows issue here. If you if you allow that sort of activity to um, to continue, it will continue and it will get worse and it will get worse. And our responsibility as police officers to look after every community. So I want to reassure you about that. I, I will come to Bobby uh, because I know we, Bobby and I spoke about this this morning and, and he'll be able to assist you with some more detail. But at any community where anything happens and they feel vulnerable, you know, we have got an asset sufficient that we can move that asset around visible local reassurance policing. So anything that needs to happen around issues such as this will happen. Um, uh, and we're here for every community with an equality of arms of how we will police uh, issues such as this. I, I, I saw the reporting both in the media and internally. Uh, and I know Bobby has been very, very alive to the issues and how people must feel seeing those messages. Um, but, but we, we won't tolerate it. We'll do what's need, needed to be done to address it. But I'll hand over to Bobby for some of the detail. Thanks, Chief. Yeah, it's sadly, you know, the housing intimidation is nothing new to us here, is it? And sort of links to Brendan's earlier point about just how intractable, in particular, the situation with paranormal abuse has been. Look, we take this exceptionally seriously. You've referenced the instance in Beaver. I know there were posters as well, I think, in Glen Gormley and Newton Abbey as well in the last couple of weeks. So in terms of the, the operational response, the local commanders are going to ensure that there's higher visibility there to provide reassurance to people within the community. In terms of an assessment as to who may be responsible for it, um, that work continues. You know, we'll work with our intelligence colleagues in particular to see if there is any potential link to paramilitary groups. It's certainly, I, I would say, more than hinted at in the, in the North Belfast kind of example that we've referred to. Um, and where where we can, we'll work very closely then with our colleagues in crime department to make sure that we can have as effective a criminal justice response as possible. But we will continue that local reassurance patrolling as well. 
thank you for that answer. I think that um, kind of police presence is important for that communities feel do feel safe. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and our final question uh, is to Mike on body worn video. John, in your accountability report, you reference uh, a forthcoming procurement exercise for new body worn video cameras. So I'm I'm wondering when you think you'll reach the point where this footage not only allows you to review what has happened, but will allow you to view in live time what is happening uh, and what difference that is going to make for policing and keeping people safe. So technology is an important part of policing. I remember when body worn videos were first made available, I had to speak to officers about this is a tool to help everybody, to help us, to help you. A number of officers were very concerned about the use of body worn. Um, I, I'll, I'll defer. I'm not quite sure where to go to on body worn. Is that you, Bobby? Potentially, I don't know. I'll defer to the to the project. Sorry. Oh, Ryan's going to have that, right? Um, what what we have to do the evidential gathering opportunities that we now have around technology, uh, and I, I'm just going to hover on body worn because what body worn video has done for so many communities is provide real reassurance around the quality, the proportionality, uh, the necessity of stop and search. Stop and search done well and properly is an essential tool, but it has to be done in a way that the communities support it. And body-worn video is one of the things that provide us all with the reassurance about stop and search. Uh, we're the police, and we have to police to look after communities. Um, so technology is really important. I'll I'll look at Ryan with regards to the specifics of, if you like, the um, looking at the next generation of body worn and how we're going to deal with that procurement. Uh, thanks, Jay. Thanks, uh, Mike. Just say first of all, Mike, as, as you expect, um, we have some internal governance around this, um, and we're still kind of the foothills of that. So, what that procurement exercise will be, body worn video, as members will know, has develop, I guess, iteratively in policing globally um, through the UK uh, and through here in, in Northern Ireland as well. With that, over time, guidance from our own policy, what we get through from National Police Chiefs Council, leadership on this in the College of Policing um, evolves over time as well. And that's a very live debate and discussion around uh, what should be recorded and when. Um, through that process of governance, we will work through all those kind of naughty and gnarly issues that there are around it. Um, and you will know that from the board's perspective, John Water will be very involved as we develop those processes as we go forward to ensure that we are um, absolutely um, putting our best foot forward in terms of our rights-based approach to the use of those cameras for members of the public and for our staff as well. Um, so those are all considerations for us down the line in terms of we move forward in this new procurement process. I mean, what we're finding, the more, rec more we record, the more stories we need, um, and uh, the more expensive the technology um, is that we seek to buy. So that'll all be uh, part of the, uh, the process as we move forward. But just to reassure, there is that good governance around it to help develop the policies and deal with those difficult questions. Thank you very much for that. Uh, that's the end of the questions uh, from this side of the table. So thanks to you and your team for taking questions and for their ongoing work on behalf uh, of the community. I uh, can't reiterate that enough. And thanks to all, of, all the people joining us here and online. And that concludes today's session. Uh, our next meeting is scheduled for the 7th of December. Thank you very much. <laughs>